So good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the core methods in deep reinforcement learning. Um, so the aim of this talk is as follows. Um, first, I'll do a brief introduction to what DeepRL is and um, whether it might make sense to apply it in your problem. Um, I'll talk about uh, some of the core uh, techniques. Uh, so there, on the one hand, we have the policy gradient methods. Uh, then on the other hand, we have uh, methods that uh, learn a Q function, including Q learning and SARSA. And um, I'll talk a little at the end about what are the pros and cons of these different methods. So first, what is reinforcement learning? Um, it's a branch of machine learning concer uh, concerned with taking sequences of actions. Um, so um, often, uh, it's described in terms of an agent inter interacting with a previously unknown environment, um, and it's trying to maximize some kind of cumulative reward, some kind of reward function that we've defined, um, accumulated over time. And uh, pretty much any kind of task where you have some kind of goal that you want to achieve can be stated in these terms. Uh, so this is an extremely general uh, formulation. Uh, what's deep reinforcement learning? It's pretty simple. It's just uh, reinforcement learning where you're using uh, neural networks uh, as function approximators. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about reinforcement learning in contrast to supervised learning is um, it's actually not totally obvious what you should use your neural network to approximate in reinforcement learning. And there are different kinds of algorithms that approximate different things. So uh, one choice is to use the neural network to approximate your policy which is uh, how the agent chooses its actions. Um, another choice is to approximate the value functions, which measure how good or bad uh, different states are or, how, or actions. And um, last, you can use the, um, you can try to learn a model of the system, a dynamics model, uh, which will make predictions about next states and rewards. OK, so I'll now give a few examples of different um, different places where you might apply reinforcement learning and what the observations and uh, actions would be. Uh, so one example is robotics. Um, so here you could imagine a robot where the observations are the camera images and the joint angles of the robot. Um, the actions are the joint torques you're applying. And um, the reward is going to depend on what you want the robot to do. So, so this is something we. Uh, as the algorithm designer get to define. So uh, the rewards could be uh, to stay balanced, uh, to navigate to some target location, or something more abstract like uh, serve and protect humans. Uh, so reinforcement learning has also been used in a lot of um, more practical applications. Um, well, applications that have been practical in the past. Uh, I think robotics will be very practical in the future. Um, but uh, for example, um, one, uh, one area is um, inventory management. Uh, so this is just one example of how you could use reinforcement learning for a decision-making problem. Uh, so you, you have to decide how much to stock up on uh, of every item. And uh, your observations would be your current inventory levels. Um, actions would be how much of each item you're going to purchase. And uh, reward is your profit. Uh, so people in operations research, this is, uh, a, this is a subfield, um, study this kind of problem a lot. Um, OK, there are also a lot of uh, machine learning problems where people have started to apply reinforcement learning techniques. So uh, one example is um, attention. Um, so the idea in attention is you don't want to look at the whole input at once. Uh, you want to just focus on part of it. Uh, so uh, one example of this is um, with a large image, you might want to just crop out part of it and uh, use that and just do detection on that part of the image. Um, so uh, here your observation would be your current image window. Action is where to look or where to crop your image. Um, and uh, reward is um, your, whether you make a classification error or not. So here the, um, the actions are trying to um, here, you have to um, try to choose the right area of the image to look at, so you'll do the correct classification. Um, reinforcement learning has also been used in um, structured prediction problems, um, which, haven't, uh, which in the past 
often uh, weren't considered to be reinforcement learning problems, uh, but it turns out that um, like to actually properly solve them, it, it actually is a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, so machine translation, for example, um, uh, you, so you get a, sor a sentence in the source language and you have to admit a sentence in the uh, target language. Um, and uh, you can, uh, here your observations are the sentence in the source language. You're emitting one word at a time in the target language. And uh, you have some reward function that looks at the whole sentence and tells you how good your translation was. Um, so since this is non-differentiable and it's, um, you, you, yeah, you can't just uh, like differentiate through the whole thing and do gradient descent. So um, it turns out you have to do, um, you can use a policy gradient method to optimize your translation system. Um, so people have started to do that. Okay, so that's uh, just, those are just a few examples, um, not exhaustive at all. Um, but uh, I just want to, uh, since I just want to say a little bit about how reinforcement learning fits into um, the, um, fits into the, the picture of all the other um, types of machine learning problems. So previous, um, I mean, previous uh, courses in this uh, series have talked about uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So how does uh, reinforcement learning relate to them? How is it different? Um, so let's just uh, first compare it to, let's look at supervised learning. So in supervised learning, first, um, the environment samples an input-output pair from some distribution row. Um, the agent makes a prediction, um, y hat, using its function f. And uh, it receives some loss, which tells it if it made the right prediction or the wrong prediction. Um, so the interpretation is um, environment asks the agent a question and then tells her the right answer. Um, so contextual bandits are, um, make this problem a little harder in that they give um, the learning agent a little bit less information. Um, so now the environment samples an input, um, but notice that there's not a correct output associated with it. Um, then the agent takes an action, and uh, the agent receives some cost, which is from um, some probability distribution. So here, um, C is the cost. We're sampling it from some probability distribution. Um, and the agent doesn't know what this probability distribution is, so that's what makes the problem hard. Um, so environment asks the agent a question, and uh, the agent answers, and the environment gives her a noisy score on the answer. Um, so this is applied, um, this actually has a lot of applications. So personalized recommendations is one big one, along with advertising. So um, you have to decide, um, like, uh, customers who liked this. I, I mean, you, you, for, you have a customer, and you know what they liked in the past, so you have to make a prediction about what they're going to like in the future. Uh, so you show them appropriate ads or links, like what either like what ad, what book you want to try to advertise to them or what video you want to show them, and so on. Um, so here you can, the big difference between this and the supervised learning setting is you don't have access to the function, uh, the loss function you're trying to optimize. So in particular, you can't differentiate through it. Um, we don't know the process that generates C, so we can't um, compute the gradient of the loss function and use that to tune the agent's parameters. So that makes it, uh, so that makes the problem uh, a bit harder, or you, you have to use a different kind of algorithm. Um, lastly, uh, reinforcement learning is um, almost the same as the contextual bandit setting, except now the environment is stateful. So now, instead of sampling um, the initial state from scratch every time step uh, from the same distribution, um, the um, state evolves over time. Uh, so you have some transition probability distribution called P here, where um, the, the state X sub T is uh, conditioned on the previous state and the previous action. And uh, that makes the problem quite a bit harder because now, well, for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, the inputs you're getting depend on what actions you're taking. So now uh, that makes it harder to develop a stable, reliable algorithm because now as the agent starts to learn, it gets different inputs. So that can lead to all sorts of um, out of control um, behavior. And it also means you have delayed effects because uh, since the system is stateful, um, uh, you might need to take a lot of actions to get into the right state. So um, you might need to, um, 
you, you can't just act greedily every time step. You have to, uh, you have to think ahead effectively. OK, so just to summarize these differences, there are two differences. The first one is you don't have full analytic access to the function you're trying to optimize. You have to query it through interaction. Uh, second, uh, you're interacting with a stateful world, which means that the input you get is going to depend on your previous actions. And if you just take the first of those differences uh, between supervised learning and reinforcement learning, you get the contextual bandit setting. So that's sort of halfway in between. OK, so uh, I realized that there are uh, multiple, this audience probably has people with different interests. Uh, some people are um, doing research and want to know about what's the latest in the research world. And some people are, um, want to apply these machine learning techniques to practical applications. Um, so this slide is um, for the latter group of people. Um, so if you're wondering, um, if you have some problem where you think reinforcement learning might be relevant and you're wondering if you should apply reinforcement learning. Um, so first, uh, I should say that um, the answer might be no. It might be overkill, especially uh, deep reinforcement learning. So this is a set of fairly new techniques where it's not going to work out of the box very well. Um, and uh, it's, these techniques aren't that well established. So they require a lot of, they have a lot of knobs to be tuned. So, uh, it might be overkill, and yeah, these techniques aren't that well established at the moment. So it might be worth investigating some other methods first. Um, so one, one, so if your problem has a small number of parameters you're trying to optimize over, and um, you have a simulator that you can uh, like just do lots of experiments on, um, then derivative-free optimization methods are likely to be better than reinforcement learning, or they're likely to be easier to get working. Um, so these methods just uh, look at, um, they just, you give them a black box function where you put in a parameter vector and it'll give you a noisy estimate of the score. And these algorithms will just optimize uh, over the parameters of that black box, I mean, that are being put into that black box. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a variety of different methods. Um, for derivative-free optimization. But these are easier to understand than reinforcement learning. And they do kind of work out of the box. Um, OK, a lot of problems are actually um, can be seen as conte are contextual bandit problems. And the statefulness of the world isn't that relevant. Um, so for example, in advertising, um, this is where people, uh, people look at advertising as a contextual bandit problem most of the time because you decide what ad to present the user with, and then they either um, click on it or, or they don't. Um, but it's really, um, the user is kind of stateful, because if you show them a terrible ad, uh, they might just go and download ad block. Uh, so uh, there is, like, your actions do have some repercussions. Um, but um, often, you can just approximate it as being a contextual bandit problem where there is no state. So. Uh, there's a better theoretical understanding of contextual bandit problems uh, and methods that are that have some guarantees. So in that case, um, it, so if, if it is a contextual bandit problem, you might want to use those kind of algorithms instead. Um, and lastly, um, the um, operations research field has been uh, using um, these methods for a while on real problems. And um, they have a set of methods um, which are um, just pretty much the basic algorithms, uh, policy iteration and value iteration, but they're um, sort of well, um, they're well developed ways of doing feature engineering for these problems that end up working pretty decently. So these uh, techniques are also worth considering instead of trying to throw a big neural network at it. Okay, so now, well, now that I've talked about what, why not to use deep reinforcement learning or what it's not good for, um, I'll just talk about um, some recent uh, success stories in deep reinforcement learning, which are achievements that probably wouldn't have been possible using these other techniques. Um, so um, a, a few years ago, there was a, a pretty um, influential result um, by uh, uh, Mani et al. from DeepMind, uh, where they used um, a deep Q learning algorithm um, to play Atari games using the screen images as input. Um, and uh, that's hard because you have these ga these games are you're all trying to do different things in all these games, and some of them are kind of complicated. So it's pretty remarkable that you can just use a simple uh, 
that a, a simple algorithm can solve them all. Um, this, the same algorithm can solve them all. Uh, so since then, people have also um, solved or, or solved this domain using uh, policy gradients and another algorithm called Dagger. Um, so another big uh, groundbreaking result was um, beating a, um, a champion level player at uh, Go, um, also by DeepMind, um, using a combination of um, supervised learning from uh, like from expert games plus policy gradients to fine tune the supervised learning policy, um, plus Monte Carlo tree search, um, plus value functions to make the search work better. So a combination of techniques in reinforcement learning. Um, robotic, uh, so some of my colleagues at uh, Berkeley had some um, very nice results uh, learning in real time how to do manipulation tasks um, using an algorithm called guided policy search. Um, using the PR2 robot. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues and I have um, been working on robotic locomotion um, using um, policy gradient methods. And uh, people have been working on locomotion for a while and have been able to achieve pretty good results uh, using uh, very like highly engineered domain-specific methods. But um, previously, there hadn't been much success using general methods to solve it. And last, uh, there have been some recent results um, playing 3D games using policy gradients. Um, in fact, there was even a contest I heard about a couple days ago with this new VizDoom uh, task, which um, is pretty nice. So you might want to check out VizDoom. OK, so that's, that's it for the high-level overview uh, part of this. Um, now I'm going to start getting into the actual formalism and the technical details. OK, so the basic object uh, in uh, the field of reinforcement learning is the Markov decision process. Um, so the Markov decision process is defined by the following components. You have a state space. This is all the different states of the system. Uh, the action space, these are all the actions the agent can take. And you have um, this probability distribution, um, which uh, which determines the probability of next state and reward. So R is the reward, S prime is the next state, S and A are the actions. So it's a conditional probability distribution. Sometimes people split this out into a separate reward function, but that's basically an equivalent formulation. Okay, and sometimes there's some extra objects to find. Um, we'll, we'll be interested in the, we'll, we'll consider an, an initial state distribution. So this is, um, the world starts out in a certain state. And uh, the typical optimization problem you want to solve, given this MDP, is to maximize expected cumulative reward. Though there are various um, ways of defining that more precisely, which I'll go into uh, later. OK. so. There are various different settings of reinforcement learning um, where you define a slightly different optimization problem. The one we'll be most concerned with is called the episodic setting. So here, uh, the agent's experience is split up into a, um, a series of episodes which have um, finite length. So in each episode, uh, we first sample the initial state of the world from some probability distribution mu. And then um, the agent uh, keeps on acting until um, the world ends up in some terminal state. Um, so just to give an example of what terminal states might be like and how an episo episodic um, reinforcement learning problem might look. Um, so one example is um, when termination is good and you want to terminate the episode as fast as possible. Uh, so if we imagine setting up a task with some kind of taxi robot that should get to the destination as fast as possible, then the episode would be like one trip, and uh, it's, terminate, it's trying to terminate the episode as fast as possible. Um, another example is um, a waiter robot um, where you have a fixed length shift, but the waiter has to accumulate. It has to do as well as possible during that shift. So there the episode has a fixed length. Um, the waiter has to, say, maximize tips or uh, uh, customer happiness. Um, and then you could imagine another kind of task where 
uh, termination is bad and you want the episode to last as long as possible. Um, so you can view life as an example of that. Um, but also you could imagine having uh, a walking robot um, where uh, you want it to walk as far as possible before it falls over. And in this setting, it's pretty easy to, to define what the goal is. Um, to, we just want to maximize the expectation of the total reward per episode. Okay, and the last object we're going to introduce here is um, a, a policy. So the policy is just the function that the agent uses to choose its actions. So we have deterministic policies, which are just, uh, the policy is denoted by pi, so we have the action is just some function of the state. And uh, we also have uh, stochastic policies where the policy is a conditional probability distribution. Um, so here is just, we're just gonna make a little bit more precise um, the setting of the episodic MDP. Um, so first we sample the initial state from this distribution mu. Um, then we, um, then we get, uh, we sample the first action from the policy, A0 from the policy. Then we sample next state and reward uh, from the transition probability distribution and so on until we reach a terminal state, S sub T. And then um, the uh, quantity we care about is the sum of all these rewards, R0 plus R1 dot 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 plus R sub T minus one. And um, we want to maximize, yeah, so eta, is, eta of pi is just defined as the um, expected total reward of the policy pi. Here's the picture that um, illustrates exactly the same thing. So you can look at it as a graphical model. Okay, and lastly, um, in the policy gradient section in particular, we're gonna be interested in parameterized policies. So here we have a parameter vector, um, theta, which specifies, uh, which specifies exactly what the policy is. So um, for example, the family of policies could be just a neural net, you have a certain neural network architecture and theta specifies uh, all the weights of this neural network. So we could have a, a deterministic policy, of course, or a stochastic policy. Um, and if you're wondering like concretely what would a policy look like, I mean, how do you use a neural network to represent your policy? It's actually exactly, you do exactly the same thing you would do if this were a classification or a regression problem. Uh, so, uh, in, so S here, the state here is your input and the action is your output. Um, so um, if you have a discrete action space, a discrete set of actions, um, then um, you would use a network that outputs a vector of probabilities, the probabilities of the different actions. This is exactly like uh, a classifier. And if you have a continuous action space, um, you, you would have your neural network output the mean and uh, the diagonal of a covariance matrix of a Gaussian distribution. Um, so this is just like you're doing regression. So you can use the same kind of architectures you'd use in supervised learning. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, just the, that's it for the formalism of MDPs. Um, so now I'm going to go into policy gradient methods, which are one uh, broad and general class of reinforcement learning methods, which are um, quite effective. So to give a brief overview of this, um, here's, here's the intuition of what policy gradient methods are gonna do. Um, so here, capital R means the sum of rewards of the whole episode. Um, so our optimization problem is we wanna maximize the expectation of the total reward um, given our parameterized policy, pi sub theta. And um, the intuition of how our algorithm is gonna work is um, we, we're gonna collect a bunch of trajectories. I mean, this is just run a bunch of episodes using our policy. And then we wanna make the good trajectories more probable. So, I mean, some of the trajectories were lucky and they were really good. Some of them, uh, the agent was unlucky and they were bad. And um, the, good, the ones that were good, meaning there was high reward, um, that means the agent probably took good actions there. So we wanna uh, increase the probability of the actions from those trajectories. So, um, so the most basic version of uh, policy gradient methods just try to make the good trajectories more probable without trying to figure out which were the good actions and which were the bad actions. 
um, slightly better methods or more um, elaborate methods uh, try to figure out which actions were good and which ones were bad. And then they try to make the good actions more probable. And um, lastly, there's another class of methods which, um, which actually try to push the actions towards better actions. So they differentiate the loss function with respect to the actions, and they try to push the actions to better actions. Um, so we're mostly going to talk about one and two here. Oh, there's a question? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. So, um, well, we're maximizing over the policy. We're trying to find uh, the best policy. But here, um, the policy is assumed to be parameterized. So there's some parameter vector theta that specifies the policy. And now we just want to maximize with respect to theta. Any other questions? OK. Um, so there's a very, um, a very fundamental, fu fundamental concept, which is called the score function grading estimator, uh, which um, underlies policy gradient methods. So actually, to introduce this, we're not going to talk about policies in RL at all. We're just going to assume uh, we have some expectation. We have expectation of f of x, where x is sampled from some uh, parameterized par uh, probability distribution. So we want to compute uh, the grading of this expectation with respect to theta. Um, so there's a general formula um, that'll do this. And the way you derive it is you just write the expectation as an integral. Um, and then you just um, move some things around. Uh, you, you swap the integral with the derivative, and you, um, you turn it back into an expectation. And uh, what you get at the end is this bottom line, which says that you take the expectation of uh, function value times grad log probability. Uh, so the in this is an unbiased estimator of the gradient, meaning if we get enough samples, it'll converge on the right thing. Um, so uh, the way you can compute this estimator, meaning the way you can get a noisy estimate of the grading of the expectation, is you um, just collect one, you just get one sample um, from this distribution, and then you compute, then you multiply f of x times grad log probability. Um, so uh, the only requirement for being able to use this estimator is uh, we need to be able to compute the probability density. I mean, we need to be able to an analytically compute it. And we need to be able to differentiate it with respect to theta. And um, often it needs to be differentiable. Um, there's another uh, way of deriving it using importance sampling. So you write down the importance sampling estimator for the expectation. And then you just uh, swap the derivative with the expectation. And you get the same thing. OK. so. So now let me just give a little bit of intuition about this estimator. Oops. OK, so f of x is measuring how good the sample x is. Um, so that means that so g hat here is our grading estimator, meaning this is what we get if we take one sample x sub i and we compute our estimator. This is our estimate of the gradient. Um, so if we move in direction g hat, um, that pushes up the log probability of our sample x sub i in proportion to how good it is. So if we have really good, um, if we got a really good function value, then we're going to try to push up its log probability a lot. And if it was a bad function value, then we're not going to try to push it up very much. So it's pretty simple intuition. Um, the really nice thing is um, this is valid even if f of x is discontinuous or if f of x is um, unknown, meaning you only uh, you don't get to differentiate it; you just get to see the function values, um, or um, the sample space um, is a discrete set, so x doesn't even have to be continuous. Um, and this is um, quite uh, this is quite remarkable, actually, that you don't even need to have access to the full. Um, you don't need to know exactly um, what the function is that you're optimizing. You just have to be able to query it um, for the function value, um, and this means this is a way of um, being able to differentiate um, functions uh, uh, through a system that has non-differentiable pieces. Um, so for example, in, um, in robotic locomotion, one issue is that um, you have contacts between the robot's foot and the ground. And um, 
contact, you make and break contact, and that causes a discontinuous change in the dynamics. Um, so that makes it really hard to do smooth optimization techniques to come up with the right behavior. So when you use this kind of um, gradient estimator, along with policy gradients, which I'm going to uh, talk about very soon, um, you can actually just uh, differentiate, you can optimize the system um, even though it has differentiable pieces in it. Okay. So, uh, okay, so here's another little picture of what's going on. So we have our function f of x, um, which we're trying to maximize the expectation of, and then we have our probability density p of x. Um, so we just sample a bunch of values from our probability density. Those are the blue dots on the x-axis. And um, then uh, we, um, so then we, we look at the function values and um, we're trying to push the uh, probability distribution so that the probability goes up at um, these samples in proportion to the function value. Um, so uh, over on the right side of the curve, uh, that means we're trying to push that fun uh, probability value up really hard. And on the left side, we're pushing it up softly. Uh, so what's going to happen is the probability density is going to slide to the right. If you can imagine a sort of physical analogy there. OK, so that's, that's the score function gradient estimator. This is a general technique. Um, it can be used in various machine learning problems. Um, now we're going to apply it to the reinforcement learning setting. And um, we're going to take our random variable x to be a whole trajectory. Um, so the trajectory consists of state action reward, state action reward, and so on until the end of the episode. And uh, now um, to get our gradient estimator, uh, to, get the, um, uh, to, to get the gradient of the expected reward, all we've got to do is um, compute the grad log probability. Uh, times the total reward. So, um, so this uh, probability of the trajectory, that sounds like a really unfriendly quantity because uh, there's uh, a long, complicated process that generates this trajectory with lots of, uh, lots of time steps. But um, log, um, OK, so we can write out what this process is, what this probability density is. Um, so we have, uh, it's just a product of probabilities. We've got our initial. Uh, We've got our mu of s0, which is just our initial state distribution. And then every time step, we, have, um, we sample the action according to pi, and we sample the next state and reward according to our dynamics model. So uh, log turns that product into a sum. And here's the cool part. Um, everything that doesn't um, contain theta drops out. Um, so the thing is, we didn't know uh, there are parts of this um, probability uh, distribution, p of tau given theta, that we don't have access to. So if this is reinforcement learning, uh, we don't assume that we know the dynamics model of the system. We just find out about it by sampling, uh, by doing, sample, doing episodes. Um, so, um, so since this uh, product turns into a sum, all the, the pieces uh, like the log, uh, log p there and the log mu, uh, which we don't know, just drop out. So it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, what we get in the end is um, we get a sum of, log, prob sum of uh, log probabilities of actions. So grad log pi of action given state. Um, so our formula looks like um, our formula for the gradient of the expectation is just the expectation over trajectories of um, total reward of the trajectory uh, times grad um, grad of the sum of all the log probs. So the interpretation of this is um, we're uh, taking our good trajectories and we're trying to increase their probability in proportion to how good they are. Um, and you can think of this as uh, being similar to supervised learning, where we treat the good trajectories with high rewards as um, positive examples in our supervised learning problem. So we're using those to train the policy on wh which actions are good. We're basically treating those actions as positive examples. OK, now we can improve this formula a little bit. Um, so that was just uh, the most basic uh, 
I mean, this is an unbiased estimator for the policy gradient. So uh, if we just take that expression inside the expectation on the right-hand side, and we take one sample of that, it has the right mean. So if we just get enough of them, we're going to get the policy gradient. Um, OK, so that's, um, but we can also write down some other formulas uh, that have the same mean but have lower variance. So we can come up with better estimators for the policy gradient. Um, and that's actually quite important because the one from the previous slide is really bad when you have uh, a, long, a large number of time steps, meaning it has really high variance. So uh, the first thing we can do is you can, uh, we can use the temporal structure of the problem. Um, by the way, to derive these next bunch of formulas, it just takes a bunch of really straightforward manipulation where you move around expectations. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the math, um, but uh, I'll just say what the formulas are. So, um, OK, so we can repeat the same argument from the previous slide. Um, to just derive the gradient estimator for a single reward term. So we end up with that reward term times the grad sum of log probs. And uh, just summing over that, we get a new formula um, where we're not multiplying the sum of the, the grad log prob of the whole thing times the sum of all rewards. Now, um, so let's look at that bottom formula. Um, now we have a sum over time of grad log probability of the action at time, that time times the sum of future rewards. Um, so, so now, I mean, in the formula from the previous slide, we would have had all the rewards in that sum. Um, but now we just have the future rewards. And um, that kind of makes sense because um, an action can't affect the probability of the um, previous rewards. Uh, so to figure out if the action is good, we should, have only, we should only be looking at the future rewards. So this is a slightly better formula than the one on the previous slide, meaning it has the exact same mean, um, except uh, different. Uh, it, the expression inside the expectation there has lower variance. Um, and uh, we can further reduce the variance by introducing a baseline. Um, so now uh, we can take any old function uh, b, which takes in a state and it outputs a real number. And, um, we can subtract it from our sum of future rewards. And um, we didn't affect the mean of the um, estimator at all. So we, yeah, we didn't change uh, the expectation at all by introducing this baseline. Um, so yeah, for any choice of B, this gives us an unbiased estimator. By the way, if you're not uh, that familiar with the terminology of estimators, what I'm saying is, uh, we have an um, expectation um, on the right-hand side of that for, uh, formula. Uh, and uh, the quantity inside that expectation is what's called the estimator. And um, if we get a bunch of samples, uh, then we can get an estimate of, um, of the thing on the left-hand side, which is what we care about. So, um, so when I say it's an unbiased estimator, that just means that, well, that just means that this equation is correct, meaning that the thing on the right-hand side equals the thing on the left-hand side. Um, so yeah, this works for any choice of baseline. And um, a near optimal choice is to use the expected return, so the expected sum of future rewards. And uh, the interpretation of that is, um, if we took an action, we only want to increase the probability of the action if it was a good action. Um, so how do we tell if it was a good action? Well, the sum of rewards after that action should have been better than expected. Um, so the B of S is the expected sum of rewards, and we're just taking the difference between the measured thing and the expected thing. Yeah, OK. So uh, that's, OK, that's the, uh, that, that was a pretty key thing for variance reduction. Um, and I'm going to introduce one last um, variance reduction technique. And actually, all three of these are really important. So um, basically, nothing's going to work um, except for maybe really small scale problems unless you do these things. Um, so the last variance reduction technique is to, to use discounts. Um, so um, the discount factor um, ignores delayed effects between actions and rewards. So what we, we're going to do here looks kind of like a hack, but there's an explanation for it, um, which is instead of taking the sum of rewards, uh, we're going to take a discounted sum of rewards, meaning that um, we, uh, we add this exponential factor, uh, gamma. 
so that um, when, so when we're multiplying the grad log probability by some future reward, uh, we multiply it by some uh, quantity that decays with time. So people typically use like gamma equals 0.99 or gamma equals 0.95. Uh, so that means, like, if you use 0.99, that means after 100 time steps, um, you're going to be um, uh, you're going to be reducing the reward by a factor of one over e. So, um, so you're exponentially um, you're decaying the um, effect of the future rewards. And the intuition is that um, an action uh, the action shouldn't affect rewards really far in the future. Like the system should um, the system. Uh, this is, like the assumption is that the system doesn't have really long-term memory, and it sort of resets its, or, or the there aren't effect, the effects aren't that far delayed. Uh, so you can just ignore um, the interaction between a, a, a action and a uh, reward way way in the future. That's the uh, intuition. Um, so now instead of taking the baseline to be the expected sum of future rewards, we want to do a discounted sum. Uh, so now we're measuring if the action was better than expected according to this, um, like the, according to the discounted sum. Um, and now there's a more general class of formulas that looks like the one that I just wrote. So this, this one that's on the top of the slide is pretty good. And um, this is like almost as good as anything you're going to do to within a small constant factor. Uh, but um, there's, there's a more general class of uh, formulas that um, look like um, grad log probability times uh, some quantity a hat, which we call the advantage estimate. And this is in general just going to be um, an estimate of, um, this is an, it has a more a precise definition, which is uh, how much, uh, how, like how much was this action um, better than a, the um, average action taken by the policy. But, in, but informally, this just means uh, how much better was the action than expected. So. And, and this formula makes a lot of sense because we want to increase the probability of the good actions and decre decrease the probability of the bad ones. So we should, um, we should increase it in proportion to the goodness of the action. OK, so just to summarize, so I just told you there's this gradient estimator, meaning there's this expression you can compute, which gives you a noisy estimate of the policy gradient. So how do you actually turn this into an algorithm? Uh, so this is silly. <laughs> Algorithm seven. Uh, so, um, so here's what the algorithm looks like. It's pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, you um, you take your policy, um, you initialize your policy parameter and your baseline function. Um, you uh, for each iter each iteration, you um, execute the um, the uh, current policy to get a bunch of whole episodes, meaning whole trajectories, and um, each time step. In the tra each trajectory, you should compute the return, meaning the sum of rewards following that time step, the sum of discounted rewards, and the advantage estimate, which is um, the sum of discounted rewards minus the baseline. Uh, then you refit the baseline by trying to um, make the baseline function equal the returns. Uh, and then um, you update the policy using a policy gradient estimator. So you're just doing SGD while updating the baseline as you go along. So that's, that's the um, vanilla policy gradient algorithm. Um, and this is, um, I'll briefly talk, th this has been used to t obtain some pretty good results. So it's not um, that bad of an algorithm. But um, there, uh, there are uh, several different directions that it can be improved. So one, one uh, issue that you run into um, is with step sizes. Um, so in supervised learning, step sizes aren't that big of a deal um, because uh, maybe you take too big of a step, um, but that's OK. Um, you'll fix it the next update. And um, your uh, current function, your current classifier, for example, doesn't affect what inputs you're getting. So even if you just um, are doing really, uh, even if your network is just kind of thrashing around for a while because you're taking too big steps, uh, that's not going to cause any problems. Um, but um, uh, yeah, and reinforce. So yeah, so step sizes aren't that big of a deal. You can just anneal them. Uh, you can start off with a large step size and anneal them down to zero, and that um, works pretty well. Um, in reinforcement learning, if you take too big of a step, you might wreck your policy. 
Um, and even if you don't actually change the network that much, so you don't lose all your nice features, um, you, you might just change its behavior a little too much. And now it's going to do something totally different and visit a totally different part of state space. Um, so since in reinforcement learning, the system is stateful and your state distribution depends on your policy, that, makes, that like brings uh, a really uh, a different problem. And uh, now, like after you took that step, the next batch of data you're going to get was collected by the bad policy. And now you're never going to recover because you just forgot everything. So um, one way um, that uh, my colleagues and I, well, one way to fix this is to try to, um, to try to stop the, basically try to stop the policy from taking too big of a, a step. So um, you can look at the KL divergence between the um, old policy and the new policy, um, like before the update and after the update, and make sure that um, the uh, distributions aren't that different. So you're not taking too big of a step. It's kind of an obvious thing to do. Uh, so my colleagues and I developed an algorithm called Trust Region Policy Optimization, um, which looks at the yeah it looks at the action distributions and tries to make sure the KL divergence isn't too large. And uh, there's this is very closely related to previous met, uh, natural policy grading methods, which uh, which are based on um, which are doing something similar, but usually it's not um, set up as a hard constraint on the KL divergence. So another um, type of extension of policy gradient methods is um, to do more, uh, to use value, uh, value functions to do um, more variance reduction. Um, instead of just using them as a baseline, you can also, um, you can use them more aggressively and introduce some bias. Um, so I won't go into the details in this talk, um, but um, sometimes these are called actor critic methods. Um, There's also another type of approach, which I briefly uh, touched on in the um, earlier slide, um, where instead of just trying to increase the probability of the good actions, you actually differentiate your loss with respect to the actions. Um, this is like the reparameterization trick, which is used um, for, um, like for density modeling and unsupervised learning. Um, so uh, here you're trying to, instead of just increasing the probability of the good actions, you're trying to push the actions towards better actions. And I'd say both of these bullet points, um, you're um, potentially decreasing your variance a lot, but at the cost of increasing bias. So it actually uh, makes the algorithms a little harder to, um, like to understand and to get them working, because um, with high variance, if you just uh, crank up the amount of data, you can always drive your variance down as much as you want. But with bias, even if no matter how much data you get, you're not going to get rid of the bias. So, if your grading is pointing in the wrong direction, then you're not going to learn anything. OK, so now uh, that, that's it for the policy gradient section of this, um, this talk. Um, so I wanted to show a quick video of uh, some work that my colleagues and I did on learning locomotion controllers with uh, policy gradient methods, which I think, um, well, I found pretty exciting when I saw it. Uh, so hopefully it's. You find it interesting. So here, what we've got is a um, humanoid a simulated. Let's see. Okay, yeah, it's a simulated humanoid robot um, in a physics simulator, a realistic uh, physics simulator called Mujoko. And uh, it has a neural network policy, uh, which takes in um, the join angles of the robot, and uh, maybe some, and a little bit of other kinematic information, like joint. It's got joint velocities and also. Um, positions of the different um, links of the robot. So that's what the input is. It's pretty much the raw um, state of the robot, like no clever feature engineering there. And um, the output is going to be the joint torques, which are set 100 times a second. So we're just mapping from joint angles to joint torques. And uh, we define a reward function, which is to move forward as fast as possible. So it gets a reward for moving forward. And um, it gets a, uh, so um, the episode ends when it, its head goes below a certain height, meaning it fell over. So that's basically the setup. There was a little bit of tweaking for the re reward function, but um, not too extensive. Um, so 
Oops. Yeah, so you can see first it just falls forward a lot of times, and then slowly it starts to develop a uh, half decent looking walk. And uh, eventually it gets it down pretty well. And at the very end of this, um, it could just keep running uh, indefinitely. So I think it was actually stable in a strong sense, meaning I could just leave it for 15 minutes and it wouldn't fall over. It would just keep going. So uh, here's another um, robot model that um, we just uh, created without too much thought. I mean, we just decided to put a bunch of legs on this thing. Um, and uh, so we don't even know how this thing is supposed to walk. Um, and uh, just give it to the same algorithm, and it just figures out uh, some kind of crazy way to walk. Um, <laughs> so that's the nice thing about reinforcement learning. Uh, you don't even need to know what you want it to do. Um, I think this is also the physics are a little unrealistic here. But <laughs> <laughs> here we set up, we used this, um, a similar model to the one in the first uh, demo, but uh, here we just give it a reward for having its head at a certain height. So there's a reward telling it to get its head up as high as possible, and then it figures out how to get up off the ground. Oh, let's see. Uh, I, have, I have low battery. Uh, does anyone have a charger that I could? <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. You're a lifesaver. Okay, any questions about policy gradients before I move on to the next part? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so the question was, is the system time invariant? Uh, yes, the, that's, that's assumed, is that it's stationary. Oh right, and also that it doesn't change from one episode to the next. Of course, in some real world problems, that might not be the case. So that's, I think that's also an interesting problem setting where you have a non-stationary environment. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was uh, for the baseline, to learn a good baseline, uh, do you need to know the dynamics of the system? Um, so no, you can just learn it by doing regression. You just uh, estimate the empirical returns, and then you do regression to try to uh, fit a function to that. Yeah, so the question is, um, there's a discount factor which, um, causes the, um, which should cause the policy to disregard any effects that are delayed by more than 100 time steps. So um, how does it still work that this guy learns how to stand up, um, even though that might take more than 100 time steps? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're right. Um, and in fact, I would say that these methods um, aren't guaranteed to work well if you have more than 100 time steps. Uh, so sometimes they work anyway. Often they work anyway, but there's no guarantee. Um, so I think there's actually something pretty fundamental missing in how, uh, like how to deal with really long time scales. And people have recently been thinking about hierarchical reinforcement learning, where you have um, different levels of uh, detail of the system, where you might have a, like one level of description where you have a, um, like a short time, a small time step, and then you have successively larger time steps. And uh, you can, that allows you to plan over much longer horizons. Um, so that's something that's currently an active area of research. But yeah, I would say that none of these methods are going to um, do, are guaranteed to do anything reasonable if you have uh, more than one over one minus gamma time steps uh, between action and reward. Oh yeah, so. In this kind of task, if you introduce terrain or something, could it? Do, uh, 
I think if it didn't, if you didn't train it to deal with terrain, then it, um, then it might fail. It probably would fail. Actually, I don't think it would fail because uh, the funny thing about these policies are actually really robust because um, you train them with the stochastic policy. Um, so there's a lot of noise being generated by the policy itself. Um, so in practice, uh, it's, um, it's actually, so it's able to deal with huge noise introduced by the policy. And as a result, um, I found that if you um, change the dynamics parameters a little, it can usually still work. But yeah, there's no guarantee that it'll do anything if you give it something you didn't train it for. Um, I, I think that you probably could train it, um, this, do the same kind of training with uh, terrain. I didn't have any terrain, so I didn't try it, but that would be nice to try. OK, I'm going to uh, move on to the next part of the talk. Uh, feel free, if you have more questions, to find me afterwards. OK, so now I'm going to talk about a different uh, type of reinforcement learning algorithm. So OK, so these, um, so the previous kind of methods are distinguished by the fact that they learn, they explicitly represent a policy, which is the function that chooses your actions, and they try to optimize it with respect to the parameters of the policy. Um, so the nice thing about the policy gradient methods we just talked about is that you're optimizing the thing you care about. Um, so, and you're optimizing it with gradient descent. So that makes it kind of easy to understand what's going on. Um, because if you take, if you're getting the proper gradient estimate and you take small enough steps, then you should be improving. I mean, of course, you still could get stuck in a local minimum, but at least, uh, or you get stuck in a bad local minimum, but at least it's a local minimum, and you can use the, our understanding of optimization to figure out what's going on. So these next class of methods are a little different because um, they're not optimizing the policy directly. Uh, they're learning something else called a Q function, uh, which measures how good um, state action pairs are. So it measures. Um, I'll, I'll say that more formally la later, but it's just measuring how good the actions are. Um, and uh, these methods are actually, um, the, uh, these are um, able to ex exactly solve um, MDPs efficiently in uh, the setting where you have a finite number of states and actions. Um, so these are, these are the preferred methods for exactly solving them in, in those settings. Um, but um, you can also apply them uh, with um, continuous states and actions and um, using, um, using uh, expressive function approximators like neural networks. But it's a little harder to understand um, what's going on in these methods, like when they're going to work and when they're not going to work. So uh, I'll define um, the relevant quantities here. Uh, so the Q function is defined as uh, the expected sum of rewards um, when we condition on the first state and the first action. Um, so we're conditioning on S0 equals S, A0 equals A, and we're, um, we're, and the Q function is the expected discounted sum of rewards uh, when we're acting under the policy pi. So um, by convention, I'm starting out with uh, time step zero. I could have also said that um, we're taking RT plus RT plus 1 plus RT plus 2 and so on. Uh, but since we're assuming the system is stationary, it should be exactly the same. So I'm, just by convention, I'm going to say that the first, I'm going to always use time 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, just for ease of notation. So the Q function is just telling you how good in this state action pair is under your current policy. Um, the value function. Well, the state value function, usually called V, is uh, just um, conditioning on the state. It's con uh, telling you how good that state is, what's the expected reward at that state. And lastly, there's an, the advantage function is the difference between the Q function and the state value function, meaning how much better is that action than uh, what the policy would have done. We're not going to talk about advantage functions in this section, but it was actually, this corresponds to the notion of an advantage estimator uh, we briefly mentioned in the previous section. So here we're going to consider um, methods that explicitly store and update the Q function instead of the policy, and um, updates them using uh, what are called Bellman equations. So 
um, so the Bellman equation, um, so a Bellman equation in general is a consistency equation that should be satisfied by a value function. Um, so here um, I'm writing down the uh, Bellman equation for q pi. And um, what it's saying is that um, the um, expected sum of rewards should be um, the first reward plus this expected sum of rewards at, after the first time step. So it's saying something pretty simple. That's, um, so R0 is the first reward. Uh, v pi of S1 is just um, adding up all the rewards at, after, at, at, after time step zero. Um, so uh, in the second equation, we write out this relationship just involving the Q function. So we have a consistency equation that the Q function should satisfy. Um, we can slightly generalize this to use um, k time steps instead of just one time step. So uh, we can expand out the um, expectation, the expected sum of rewards to write, write out k rewards explicitly and then uh, cap it off with the value function at the very end, which accounts for all the rewards after that. Okay, so here's the Bellman equation from the previous slide. So now I'm going to introduce a very important concept called a Bellman backup. So, uh, so we have this equation that the, uh, value, the um, value function q pi should satisfy, um, but we don't know q, let's assume we don't know q pi. So let's say we have some, uh, some other q function. Um, so we define uh, this Bellman backup operator that, uh, that operates on an arbitrary Q function. So it maps a Q function to a new Q function. And uh, it's defined by just taking the right-hand side of the Bellman equation and uh, plugging in um, our Q function, our new Q function Q instead of the um, Q pi. So uh, Q pi is a fixed point of this operator, uh, meaning if we apply the uh, backup operator, we get it the same thing back. And, um, and very nicely, if we keep applying this backup operator repeatedly to any old arbitrary initial um, Q function Q, the series will converge to Q pi, which is the fixed point of the operator. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's, um, so that way you can, uh, you can, um, one way you can use an iterative algorithm to estimate Q pi by taking any old initial Q function and repeatedly applying this backup operator. Um, so now there's another kind of Q function that we're going to introduce uh, called Q star. So the previous Q function Q pi was this is the uh, telling you uh, the value function under the current under some policy pi. So it only makes sense with regard to some particular fixed policy pi. Q star. Um, is going to be um, is going to involve the optimal policy instead. So, um, so Q star is just defined as the Q function of the optimal policy. So here we have pi star, the optimal policy, and Q star is just the Q function of the optimal policy. And um, it also happens to be uh, the pointwise maximum over all policies of uh, the Q function um, at each state action pair. So, uh, so the optimal policy is deterministic, and um, it should satisfy this equation that um, it takes the arg max of the optimal Q function. So recall that the Q function tells you your expected return if you take the, um, the given action. Um, so obviously, the optimal policy should take the action that has the best expected return. So that's why, um, that's why this last equation is um, evident. Um, so, um, so now, now that we know this property of the optimal policy, uh, we can rewrite the Bellman equation. So, uh, so on the, that, that first equation is, that's just the Bellman equation from the previous slides for a given policy pi. Um, now um, we can take that expectation over actions and replace it by what the optimal policy is going to do, which is just going to take, it's going to take the arg max of the uh, optimal Q function. There's a typo on my slide. That should say Q star um, inside of, um, on the right-hand side. So, um, so now we have a Bellman equation that the optimal policy should satisfy. Uh, 
Now we can do the same thing with the backup operator. Um, so um, we, we take that Bellman equation and we uh, plug in an arbitrary Q function on the right-hand side instead of the optimal Q function, Q star. Um, so uh, Q star um, is a fixed point of this Bellman operator. That's just a restatement of the Bellman equation. And uh, again, if we reply um, this uh, Bellman operator repeatedly to an arbitrary initial Q function, it converges to Q star, which is the optimal Q function. This is um, the Banach fixed point theorem in both cases it can be used to prove it. OK, so based on these ideas, um, there are two classic algorithms for exactly solving MDPs. These are sometimes called dynamic programming algorithms because they're actually quite related to the kind of dynamic programming algorithms that are used to solve uh, search problems. Um, so one is called value iteration. And you just initialize your Q function arbitrarily. And you repeatedly do Bellman backups until it converges. Uh, the second one is called policy iteration. Um, you initialize your policy arbitrarily. Uh, then uh, each step, you uh, first can compute um, either exactly or approximately uh, the Q function of that policy. And then uh, you update your policy to be the greedy policy for the Q function you just computed. Uh, so that means that uh, you, your new policy just takes the argmax of the Q function. So it takes the action that's best according to that Q function. Um, so I didn't say anything about how you compute Q pi. Uh, so one way to do it is to compute it. Um, you can compute it exactly because it happens that the Bellman equation for Q pi is a linear system of equations. So often you can just solve them exactly. Um, more commonly, well, if you have a large scale problem, you might not be able to solve this system. Uh, so what people often do is they do um, a finite number of Bellman backups, uh, which gives you, which doesn't exactly converge on Q pi, but it, uh, it gives you something that's approximately Q pi. Okay, so that's, um, I just told you algorithms that you can implement if you have full access to the MDP, like you know the whole table of probabilities. Um, but in reinforcement learning, Usually, the assumption is that you don't know any of these probability distributions. You don't know the reward function. You don't know the transition probabilities. So all of these things have to be um, estimated from data, or, they have to, or you're only able to access the system through interaction. So now it turns out that these uh, algorithms can be um, also implemented if you only access the system through interactions, which is kind of remarkable, I think. Um, so, so the way it works is, um, so let's recall our backup formulas for Q pi and Q star. Um, so we can, um, so we can, in both cases, uh, we have this a certain quantity inside an expectation. In both both cases, we can compute an unbiased estimator um, of the right of that quantity inside the expectation, just using a single sample. Meaning, uh, if we have, uh, if we sampled some data from our system. Um, using any old policy, uh, then uh, we can get an unbiased estimator of the quantity on the right-hand side of those expectations. I mean, the quantity on, in, inside of the right-hand expectations. So basically, we can do an approximate version of this uh, Bellman backup, uh, which is unbiased. Um, and uh, even with this noise, so we're doing a noisy version of the Bellman backup. Even with this noise, it can be proven that if you, do, if you choose your step sizes appropriately with the right schedule, you're still going to converge to um, Q pi um, or Q star, um, depending uh, on which algorithm you're implementing. OK, so now, well, well, I'll say at this point that this is uh, pretty much the fundamental idea. And now you can, uh, you can come up with algorithms uh, that can be applied in the uh, reinforcement learning setting where you're just accessing the system through sampling. And you can also uh, it start introducing function approximation here. So it's, I haven't said anything about what the Q function is. I've just told you it's a function of state and action. Um, but now we can start having neural network Q functions, for example. Um, so, uh, so we can parameterize the Q function with the neural 
network, um, let's call it Q theta. Um, and now, um, instead of doing the Bellman backup, I mean, it doesn't make sense to do the Bellman backup exactly because we're not just setting the values of the neural network output. Um, the best we can do is try to um, like encourage the neural network to have some output values. So what we do is instead of doing the, um, the way we do this backup is we set up a least squares problem. Uh, so we write down this quadratic objective that says that the Q function should be approximately equal to the backed up value, and then we just minimize it with uh, SGD. Um, so one version of this algorithm, uh, which was introduced about 10 years ago, called neural fitted Q iteration, um, well, it works exactly the way you'd expect. You sample trajectories um, using your current policy, uh, which might be um, determined by the Q function, or it could be any old policy, as it turns out. Um, and uh, then you, um, you solve the least squares problem, where you're trying to minimize um, this quadratic, um, you, you try to minimize this quadratic error, which is um, based on the um, Bellman backup, the backup for Q star. So um, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned so far is what do you actually use as your policy? So I said sample trajectory using your policy. Um, so if you have a Q function, you can turn it into a policy um, by just uh, taking the action that has the highest Q value. That's what you typically do. So the Q function measures the goodness of all your actions. So you can easily turn that into a policy by taking your best action or by taking actions um, where uh, the log probability is um, proportional to the goodness or something like that. So you, you might take typically probability is, uh, is exponential of Q value um, over some kind of temperature parameter. Um, that's called Boltzmann exploration, um, whereas um, if you use just the um, greedy, if you just take the argmax, that's called the greedy policy. So um, it turns out that with these kind of Q learning algorithms, you don't have to execute the greedy policy um, to, for learning to work. Um, there's, you actually have some freedom in what policy you can execute, um, which is actually one very nice property of these algorithms, that you can use an exploration technique, um, which uh, where your policy is actively trying to reach um, new states or do something new and uh, still learn the correct, uh, still uh, converge, still move towards Q star or Q pi as the case may be. Okay, so that's, uh, so that's a, um, a very basic, neural fitted Q iteration is sort of a basic way of doing this. Um, a more recent algorithm that's gotten a lot of attention is the one that was um, from uh, Mani et al. from DeepMind, uh, which is basically an online version of this algorithm uh, with, a, with a couple of um, useful tweaks in it. So, um, and, but actually when you look at the two tricks, they're actually kind of um, very, um, they make a lot of sense if you just think about what value iteration is doing. So uh, one, uh, one technique is uh, you use this uh, replay pool where it's a rolling history of your past data. And um, that's just the data you're going to use to fit your Q function. Um, so that makes sure you have like a representative sample of data um, to uh, fit your Q function to. And um, the second, the second uh, idea is to use a target network. Um, so instead of using your Q, current Q function and just doing Bellman backups on that, um, you have some lagged version of your Q function. Uh, so you have this target network, which is a copy of your Q function at some earlier time and you use that in the backups. So that also, um, if you think about value iteration, uh, you're trying to, you have your old Q function and you're trying to make the new one equal to the backed up version of the old one. So using the target network just is sort of the natural thing to do if you're trying to implement value iteration in an online way. Um, so, and there have been many extensions proposed since then. I've got a bunch of citations at the bottom of the slide. Um, so this algorithm, the D, uh, DQN algorithm, uh, is, um, is using the um, backup B, which is the backup for Q star. Um, remember that I also introduced this other backup B pi, which is the backup for Q pi. Um, so, so there's another algorithm, like a very classic algorithm called SARSA, uh, which um, is an online way of um, doing the B pi backup, essentially. Um, well, it's sort of an online version of policy iteration. Um, uh, but uh, so it's, it's actually um, found to work as well 
um, or better than DQN, well, better than using the B backup in some settings, um, not all settings. So I think the jury's still out um, on exactly um, how these things compare. Um, but uh, it's, I think um, it's worth considering both policy iteration and value iteration and, and all the different online versions of these algorithms and taking them seriously because it's not clear right, uh, right now exactly which are, uh, how, how they all compare to each other in the function approximation setting. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the overview of all the technical parts. And now I just have a couple conclusion slides. Um, so, so let me just summarize the current state of affairs. I introduced uh, two kinds of algorithms, uh, policy gradient algorithms, which explicitly represent a policy and optimize it, and um, Q function learning algorithms, which explicitly represent a Q function, which is the goodness of different actions, and use that to implicitly represent a policy. Um, so, so policy gradient methods, there's a lot of, um, uh, so there have been some successes with different kinds, different variants of it. So you have vanilla policy gradient methods. Um, there is a recent paper um, on this uh, A3C method, um, which is an async uh, implementation of it, uh, which gets very good results. Um, there's also um, another kind of methods are the natural policy gradient methods, trust region methods. Oh, so the video I showed you was obtained using uh, trust region policy optimization, which is one of these in, in the second category. So that makes it, um, I think these trust region methods nat and natural policy gradient methods are uh, more sample efficient than the um, vanilla methods because uh, you end up, um, you're doing more than one uh, gradient update with each little bit of data you collect. So with the vanilla policy gradient, you just compute one little gradient estimate and then you throw it away. With natural policy gradient, you're solving a little optimization problem with it, so you get more juice out of it. Um, so that's, um, that's what we have in the policy gradient world. Um, and uh, in the Q function world, we have uh, the DQN algorithm and uh, some of its relatives. Um, and these are sort of uh, descendants of value iteration, um, where you're approximating the Bellman backup using value iteration. Um, and then SARSA is um, also, it's um, related to policy iteration. Um, these are both different, I mean, these are uh, estimating different, they're dealing with different Bellman equations. So it's kind of interesting that both kinds of methods work and they all, they're both, they have fairly similar behaviors as it turns out. Um, so here's what I would say the, um, Here's how I would compare them, and this is um, like anecdotal evidence, but uh, I think this is the consensus right now. Um, the Q function methods are more sample efficient when they work, um, but uh, they don't work as generally as policy gradient methods, and it's a little harder to figure out what's going on uh, when they don't work. Um, and that kind of makes sense because in the policy gradient methods, you're optimizing exactly the thing you care about with gradient descent, whereas with Q function methods, you're doing something indirect where you're Optimize, you're trying to learn a Q function, and then you're hoping that it gives you a good policy. Um, and yeah, so I would also point out that there, um, there are also some confounds, so it's hard to make a good conclusion at this point because people use um, uh, different um, like time horizons in the policy gradient methods versus the Q function methods. So they do one step look aheads on the Q functions and uh, multi-step look aheads on the policy gradients. So it's not clear if the extra, if the differences come from like using different time horizons or um, some differences in how the algorithms are working because you're either doing regression for a Q function versus uh, learning a policy using policy gradients. Um, so just to summarize it, I would say here, here are some of our core model-free reinforcement learning algorithms. And uh, they, oh, whoops, uh, I'm missing a word in the first column, which I think should say uh, re like reliability and robustness. Uh, so this just means like, is it going to work on um, new problems without, um, like without parameter tuning? Um, or is it going to um, mysteriously either work or not work? Um, so this, this would be my um, slightly sloppy summary of um, all these different algorithms. I would say there's still some room for improvement. Um, there might be some improvements in the basic methods because 
Uh, there's some nice properties of the Q function methods um, that we don't have in the policy gradient methods. Like you can easily do off, you can easily um, explore with a different policy than the one that you're um, learning the Q function for. And that's really important. Um, you can't do that very easily with policy gradient methods. Um, whereas the policy gradient methods just seem like they're more, um, you can just apply them and they're like more likely to work. And uh, it's well understood what's going on. So I think, yeah, there's still, I, I don't know if it's possible to get the best of both worlds, but that's, uh, that's the hope. Um, and uh, that's it for my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Oh yeah, so in model-based reinforcement learning, uh, what lines of research do I find most interesting? I think the work uh, from my colleagues on guided policy search is very nice. So I would say that's a kind of model-based reinforcement learning. Um, I also like, um, there's some methods that are using the model for faster learning, uh, like for variance reduction. So there's a paper called Stochastic Value Gradients that I like a lot. Um, I think it's a pretty wide open area. So I don't think there have been uh, a lot of really compelling results uh, where you're able to learn extremely fast. Uh, I, like you're able to learn with much better sample efficiency using a model. So it seems like that should be possible, but I don't think it's been demonstrated um, yet. So maybe in the next couple of years, we'll see that happen. Hello. Uh, Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. So I have a question is that, is it true or not true that um, most of this problem requires some kind of simulated uh, world to, to uh, run experiments in the episodes, right? Oh yeah, so um, are you asking, um, does this work in the real world? Is that the yeah. question? Or yes. does, um, yeah, I would say um, it, it does work if you have a lot of patience and you're willing to execute this thing for a while. So the um, locomotion results I showed um, add up to about two weeks of real time. Uh, so it's actually not that bad, especially when you consider uh, that babies, uh, toddlers take a while to learn how to walk properly, even though evolution already puts in a lot of uh, built-in information. Um, so. Uh, I'd, I'd say um, maybe, yeah, I'd say it, it's, it can be run in the real world. Some of my colleagues in Berkeley are doing uh, some experiments where they are running just regular reinforcement learning algorithms in the real world. Um, very brave, um, but uh, I, I hope to see some nice results from that soon. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk here on the other side. Here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what was your intuition on the lost surface of those uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, optimization problems, and um, maybe especially how it evolves in the, from the, as the policy learns, and I should specify in the policy gradient case. So I think the situation is a little bit different in reinforcement learning from in supervised learning. Uh, so in reinforcement learning, the uh, loss, you have, um, you have one, kind of local minima uh, in policy space. Um, so for example, um, let's say you want your, so I am go keep going back to the locomotion example because I spent a lot of time on it, but uh, let's say you want your robot to walk. Um, there's one local minimum where it just stands and it doesn't bother to walk because there's too much penalty for falling over. And there's another local minimum where it just dives forward because uh, it gets a little bit of reward for that uh, before it falls to its doom. Um, so. Uh, so even, so I think that that's actually the, the hard part about the, uh, like the optimization problem is actually defined, is because of the different be space of behaviors and actually has nothing to do with the neural network. Um, so I've also found that, um, yeah, it matters surprisingly little what kind of architecture you use, um, like what kind of neural network architecture you use because I think that most of the hardness and the weirdness of the problem comes from uh, like what the behavior space looks like rather than what the actual numerical optimization landscape looks like. Cool, thank you. So uh, there are many problems where uh, 
the reward is only observed uh, at the end of the task, so in the final, in the terminal state in each episode, uh, and you don't see rewards uh, in intermediate states. So how much harder do these problems become for deep reinforcement learning in your experience? Thanks. Yeah, so you have, if you don't get the reward until the end, then, um, then you can't, um, well, then it's probably, it might be harder to learn. Yeah, I, I don't have anything, uh, anything precise to say about that. I think it's going to be harder if you have less, if your uh, rewards are further away. Yeah. So, so for example, for your, uh, in your video, for the last example of getting up and getting the head above a certain height, yeah. for example, that could be one where you only get a plus one if you're above and you don't get anything below. Oh, right. Are you doing something that was kind of, if you get your head higher, then you still get something partial? Yeah, so I think we uh, came up with a reward like distance from height squared, um, which made the problem easier. Um, yeah, the problem would have been a lot harder if you get zero reward until you get your head above the height. Um, and it's actually, um, that would be a problem of exploration, which is that you have to um, explore all the different states to figure out where you're going to get good reward. Thanks. OK. Uh, one last question. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about how do you choose to quantize your space time? Because in your local motion example, it clearly has a continuous system. Right. Uh, yeah, so it's actually really important how you discretize time, like what time step you use, because um, if uh, because the algorithm has, um, I mean, the algorithm does care about what the time step is. So it's not like, um, yeah, because you, um, you, you have discount factors and you're also uh, sampling a different action at every time step. So um, yeah, so if you choose too small of a time step, then, uh, you, then the rewards will be delayed by more time steps. So that makes the, like the credit assignment harder. And also um, your exploration will be more like a random walk because you're changing your minds really frequently. So yeah, the time step is pretty important, and I'd say that's, um, that's a flaw in current methods. OK, thank you. So the same thing with John Deere Thank you. So take a short break. We convene in 15 minutes.